about ready to start. Hello, everybody. Hello, I'm Jackie Russell. I'm the Artistic Director of Chicago Children's Theater. Welcome to Chicago Children's Theater's Meet the Artist with Diamond's Dream creators, Jarell L. Henderson and Caitlin McLeod, hosted by students from Urban Explorers of Chicago. Chicago Children's Theater is Chicago's largest professional theater company devoted to children and families. Since COVID, we have been very busy. We have pivoted and moved our theater online with virtual productions and classes. Today, we are very excited to get artists and children in the same room together today to talk and to explore Diamond's Dream. This webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to find it later on our YouTube channel, CCTV. Thank you so much to Urban Explorers of Chicago and to their founder, Janice Cowley, for joining us today. Now I will hand it over to Janice to tell us a little more about Urban Explorers. Take it away, Janice. Hi, I'm Janice Cowley. I'm the creative founder of Urban Explorers of Chicago, which is a STEAM mobile school here located right in Chicago, Illinois. Um, founded in 2020 while, while during a pandemic. Um, this was a creative idea that not only um, was able to bring together communities here in Chicago, but especially within neighborhoods where students um, you know, are able to learn about science, technology, engineering, and the arts, and of course, math. And so to be a part of Chicago Children's Theater um, in partnership uh, with tonight's evening um, interview, we're truly excited and I'm elated to just have my students be a part of that. And so thank you for having us. Thank you, thank you so much. We're thrilled that you're all here. Well, I'll tell you what, we are ready to pivot to take a look at uh, some of our video that we have to share with you uh, to give you a little bit of a sizzle for Diamond's Dream. you can see a lot of love went into this piece, Diamond's Dream. It's an idea that came from Springboard. Springboard is a new works initiative started by Chicago Children's Theater during the COVID pandemic to foster new voices and ideas for Chicago's children's theater from a diverse and innovative community of theater makers. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our artist, Jarell L. Henderson, who's a director, puppeteer, and an assistant professor of performance studies at Chicago State University, who directed our hit show, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, and also wrote and directed Diamond's Dream. And Caitlin McLeod is a Chicago area costume scenic and puppet designer. She designed our costumes for The Very Hungry Caterpillar, and she designed and built Diamond's Dream. So I'm going to hand it over now to Jarell and Caitlin and let them do their thing. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jarell. 
uh, the director of Diamond's Dream and one of the, the writer uh, co co created with Caitlin. And um, yeah, it's, I'm really really happy to be with all of all of you here today. I think that um, for me, the creation of Diamond's Dream had a lot to do with trying to um, make sure that. We, <laughs> For me, Diamond's Dream was to be a gift. I, I hope that it would be a gift, kind of from you know the perspective that I had to offer as an adult, but maybe uh, put together in a way that would be useful for folks who were not yet adults yet and might have been trying to make sense of the world. And so the colors that you see, the story that you see, is all a result of you know myself and Caitlin wanting to do all that we could to you know give Chicago this this gift. Caitlin, did you have anything else? Uh, yeah, uh, Jackie first approached Darrell and he wanted to have me on board as well as another, another perspective, but also like a creative builder force. Uh, Darrell definitely took over, like once we came up with our idea over the summer, Darrell fleshed out the narrative, um, while I fleshed out the like visuals that you saw. Um, and I'm trying to think, uh, yeah. From the beginning, we were interested in a world of magic and a world that was urban and a world that dealt with bigger issues than you might see in some other like children's theater programming. Um, so we wanted we wanted to be serious about the world we're in, and we know people of all ages can have like harder conversations about bigger topics. Um, so we wanted to create that in a world of magic. Uh, yeah, so I think, um, I don't know how far you want me to go with that. Yeah, uh, oh, also I just remembered, um, you know, in that in that urban world, it's like, you know, I grew up in an inner city, I didn't grow up in Chicago, but I grew up in Philly, which to me has a very similar feeling. So as a child, I used to walk around Philadelphia and kind of wonder if there were magical places in the city. I had a very active imagination and I've always loved tall tales and, fairies and legends and fairy tales and legends and things like that. So in creating Diamond's Dream, it was like, how can we make something that's every day like riding on the red line? How can we make that fantastical? How could we make that a magical experience? How can we encourage our audience to imagine? So that was, that was also really, really important to our process. Yeah, and then I think we always had the idea to incorporate puppetry and mm -hmm. different um, just other ways of showing magic in a theater world. Um, I think as we be as we moved from coming up with the story idea to creating the story, uh, we knew we had to do it all kind of in the smaller scale of toy theater, which both of us were familiar with um, from going to grad school together. Uh, so we were really excited actually by that possibility. And then from there, we knew everything since, since it had to be that smaller scale, we wanted it all to feel cohesive. So that's why everything was hand built. Um, and then, uh, Jarrell and Jeff, Jeff Pascal, who was our, uh, director of photography. And for those of you that don't know what that title means, it means you are the cameraman in the film room who's kind of like deciding what you can see in the camera frame and building the story that way to make sure that you're focusing on the right parts of the narrative, um, as opposed to just kind of having a broad frame that captures like the entire space of the train. He's deciding like what parts the camera's focusing on, um, which was really another level of storytelling that we needed him to bring Absolutely. to the table as a traditional theater artist. Um, so he was he was a great asset as we transitioned into the film room. Yeah, from there, once the film was made, I, you know, I, I had made another short puppet film, but that one didn't have dialogues. The characters didn't speak. It's, it's kind of like a silent film. So there are cards with words on them. But for this one, I knew that there were going to be, uh, there was going to be language, dialogue when the, when the uh, puppets speak. And so for that, uh, with the help of CCT, we were able to cast two fantastic performers, Am uh, Amira Dannon, who played uh, the elder, or Luella, the young uh, girl who we meet, and of course, uh, Davu Smith, 
who uh, voiced the character of Diamond. Uh, Caitlin and I both worked with Davu a few years ago when he was in uh, the, a production I directed called The Dark at the Top of the Stairs. It's an old timey American play and Davu played a child in the, in the play. So he was cast and so um, both Caitlin, Caitlin and I thought that, you know, we remembered him and his fantastic energy and we thought that he would be perfect for Diamond and then he just was. And Amir was another uh, performer that I had worked with before in Chicago, who I thought had a wonderful spirit, um, very calm, very mature. But there's also a curiosity and a sadness sometimes to um, to to how how her characters can resonate. There's a real beauty to them, and, and we wanted Luella, the little girl, to have you know to have all of the spirit kind of packed inside of of you know what would be a tiny body this child's body but she's got so much to offer uh and so once we had so let's see it was caitlin and i and i i had the story and caitlin's making puppets jeff is helping us figure out how we're going to shoot things we've got amira and uh Davu who are adding their voices it's going to be on uh cc tv i believe uh chicago children's theaters tv um, on YouTube, their YouTube channel, which you can access through chicagochildrenstheater.org, I want to say. <laughs> it might be calm. Sorry, yeah. Jackie. Sorry, got it. <laughs> um, but yeah, and so from there, then we need sound. So Dan, Daniel Eisen, or Dan Eisen, as he goes by, who is currently on the East Coast, he uh, helped us set up recording sessions for our actors. And then he created, so that music that you hear when the train is first coming in, all the, and the when the train leaves at the end, that's all the original music that was created by Dan. And he also put in the sounds of the wind when Diamond gets pushed back into the train, you know, sounds when the train turns upside down. So we had a lot, a lot of help. Um, from Dan, and it was important to me that we surrounded ourselves with people who were not only representative of the community that we were gonna be talking about in terms of being on the South Side of Chicago, knowing that that's a predominantly African-American area. Um, it wasn't just about that, but it was also about having um, a collection of folks who were going to work together, um, who could trust each other, um, and who was gonna be just kind of fun in the room. Oh, and one, I want to give a shout out to our dramaturg, Danae Hill. Danae is one of my uh, former students from Chicago State University, uh, 95th and MLK. She's still, she's a senior now, about to graduate. Um, but Danae Hill, who was a former student of mine, um, dramaturgy is like research. So when, uh, the, when Luella or the elder spirit is talking about her childhood, you know, a hundred or so years ago, that's research. You know, when, when we, you know, some of the deeper themes and your teachers and parents can explain that to you. But I wanted to make sure that we at least gave Danae a shout out because even though we're figuring out how to explain what her work means, the one thing that I know for sure is that you have, if you've watched this film, you've been affected by her work. Her work is so very present in there. And so that collection of myself, Caitlin, Jeff Pascal, Dan Eisen, and Danae Hill, along with the fantastic people at Chicago Children's Theater, you know, that, that's where, you know, we got, and we listen to a lot of music while filming. We listen to every kind of Christmas music because we filmed it over the holiday break. So every kind of holiday music you can imagine, we listen to, um, <laughs> we had a lot of fun. We, we laughed a lot. Yeah, I would say Danae really helped us like anchor the specificity of the elders flashback and kind of more of her backstory. We had an idea of what it was, but really like pinpointing specific things that was going on in Chicago at that time and where it was happening was really helpful. And um, yeah, and then I personally was there for a few days of filming. I wasn't there every day, but the days I was there was a lot of fun. And I would say after Christmas, you guys switched to a lot of soul. And oh, that's right. I'm about <laughs> it, was that. A, yeah. it was a lot of- <laughs> It was a 90s. lot, wasn't it? It was. Yes. We, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was a good time, good time. It was a lot of fun music. I think we went through like every decade of the 20th century and just looked yeah. at the different music from those different eras because what you listen to when you're working goes into the work, yeah? What you're thinking of, what you talk about, it's true. The spirit or the energy that you bring into a room, that's the energy that you use to create with. Um, 
are those some of the actual puppets behind Caitlin? <gasps> Caitlin? Yes, they are. Uh, we each got to pick a few to bring home afterwards, so I made sure to have them in the frame of my uh inside the frame of my zoom camera yeah yes i could i could go get a couple of them they are small but they look they look a lot bigger on film don't they <laughs> i actually have a couple that i can share uh and show everyone oh would you too yep so here oh, look at that behind the scenes oh that's jeff that's Jeff Pascal, who was our uh, DP, director of photography and cinematographer. He was also the editor. <laughs> He's fantastic. Oh, so so Caitlin, how many cutouts? How many cutouts did you make overall, like all together? I don't know if I got an accurate count. I think this picture that Kay has up right now is almost all of them. I want to say, or that might have been. Before the fuzzies. It's before the fuzzies. Built. That's why I'm it asking. Because <laughs> the built, fuzzies. <laughs> yes. Over Christmas break, I was making a lot of the puppets that came at the end of the story. Uh, um, yeah, I never got a full count. But um, the reason why they're so small, um, so they're five inches tall. Um, we made the train to be about one inch scale, which means one inch in real measurement is about one foot in like an actual train car's size. So with that in mind, um, then I wanted to keep the scale the same for all of the puppets. So that means Diamond, if he's around five feet tall, is five inches tall in puppet form. Um, and yeah, that's uh, something that was really helpful in terms of when I was making some of the other puppets, um, just keeping that scale in mind. So then I was like, okay, how much bigger do we want the demon to be for, compared to diamond? Um, but yeah. Looking yeah, at and it's all so that everything will fit together because our picture, you know, when you come to a theater, a lot of it is framed by, you know, it might look like a box or it might look like half a circle. Our frame for the virtual world is literally the screen that you see in front of us. And we want everything to look as real as possible within that frame. And so you have to do different measurements and look at different sizes because you want you want to make sure that Diamond looks like, you know, he's about 11 or 12. We want, you know, our elder spirit to look like she's about 11 or 12. And so there are certain expectations in size. And so that's a lot of the detail. You know, Caitlin did so much detailed work on this. I'm, you know, we were always, Whenever Caitlin would bring in puppets, I mean, you know, when we talk about the holidays, no matter <laughs> what you celebrate, if you celebrate anything, every time Caitlin stopped by, it was a gift because she was bringing more puppets that we got to play with. <laughs> we got to play with all of those puppets. Oh, what a, I mean, come on. It's, it's great. It's fantastic. You know, and Caitlin also made the crankies. Mm -hmm. So when you see the piece of paper going along, it's called the cranky. And so one person turns. And as the person is turning, that paper, you know, goes along and you see the image move across the screen. So it's all handmade. It's all hand built. So, you know, kudos to Caitlin, also to Will Bishop, who was one of the folks at Chicago Children's Theater who helped us operate that cranky a lot um, so that we would have a background that made sense. That's wonderful. All right. Are we ready for our question answer session? I think we are. Let's have our student hosts turn their cameras on it's time turn your cameras on fantastic all right so we're gonna go around everyone's gonna introduce themselves and say their favorite part of seeing the show and we're gonna start it off with tj so tj take it away hi my name is tj and i am thoroughly excited to be your host representing urban exposure chicago i am a history buff so my favorite part of Diamond Stream was connecting this pandemic to the Spanish flu. Now over to our next host. Hi, I'm Zamara, and I'm very happy to be one of the hosts on Urban Explorers and also representing Urban Explorers. My favorite part about Diamond Stream would probably have to be like the beginning 
like where he, she scares him and you know he says coronavirus coronavirus that's you know one of my favorite parts because it's very funny to me on to our next host my name is noah and i'm very happy to be here as one of your hosts i would have to say my favorite part of diamond's dream would probably be um well actually i don't really have a favorite part because it was just all really awesome but yeah on to our next house hi i'm sasha and i'm very excited to be representing urban explorers of chicago and being one of the hosts i am also very pleased to be meeting you guys today one of my favorite parts of Diamond's dream would have to be the opening scene, scene like Damar mentioned, where he was, where Diamond was just sitting on the train waiting to get to his grandma, and Lo Lo Ella just randomly appeared, and he was like, whoa, 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 six feet, excuse me, there's a pandemic going on, and yeah, the whole thing was also just really amazing. My name is Casper and I am one of your hosts and my favorite part was when and he recognized when he saw Luella on the ceiling but then he recognized that that he was act he was the one that was actually on the ceiling and then he fell down because it was super funny he and on to the next host uh my name is Lennon, and I will be representing Urban Explorers of Chicago. One thing I liked about Diamond's dream was I could relate. I have lost family during COVID-19. It hurts, and you want to see them before they go. On a different note, I thought some parts were also very funny. Now over to our next okay. no. Hello, my name is Mateo, and I also will be representing Chicago or Urban Explorers of Chicago. And my favorite part is when she's explaining why she got here. And it, I think it was a very clever way to explain it. Okay. Hi, I'm Kennedy, and I'm thrilled to meet the two of you and be your host while representing Urban Explorers of Chicago. One of my favorite parts in the movie was when um, Lilo, I think, and Diamond started to really connect, and they started to hear each other's story, and then when they had, like, the little red background, I really loved the color scheme of that. Hi, I'm Francisco Ramos, representing Urban Explorers of Chicago, and I want to tell you my favorite part of the movie of the show was when like when um diamond diamond actually found out he was upside down just like just like everybody else said it was pretty funny and but until until the girl um told her backstory about the spanish flu it got me it was my favorite part and it got me pretty sad and until um t until diamond found out that her that his grand that, that and until his grandma died so that was actually my favorite part of the movie hi my name is Xavia, and i am very happy to to be one of your hosts and my favorite part is when diamond when he sprayed um Larius, I believe her name is, and when he drew, drew a picture of her and his family, and I think he drew a picture of her, his fa I mean, her family as well. Hi, my name is Inga, and I'm happy to be here. I, the, um, my favorite part of my favorite part of Diamond's dream is when. Is when Luella turned into that really pretty bird and fought off that one eyed bird. Oh, well, I can I tell my favorite part? Okay. For one, I'm a product of Inglewood and traveling to and from high school, I would always take the red line. 
And so when I recognize the 69th Street stop, stop I live on six, why? Well, my parents still do reside in Inglewood on 69th Street. And so we would always take that train, getting to 87th Street, going to CVS High School. And so to be able to see that you chose the red line and for him to be heading southbound, really, I was like, whoa, this is going to be awesome. And just to see you take our city and put it right where it needs to be, just in the middle of a pandemic for children to be able to recognize um, our city and how, like one of the students, uh, one of the questions are going to be just concerning the health and um, the virus and everything as it relates to um, different ethnic, ethnic groups. And so I want to thank you for spotlighting um, that awareness. I think we're ready for our question answer session now, right? So let's kick it back over to TJ. I think you have the first question. This question is for Jarrell or Caitlin. If you could add or delete anything from the production, what would it be? Wow, I love that question. Thank you so much for asking it. Um, so if I could, I would definitely add more about Diamond's backstory and more about Diamond's uh, family situation, more about his grandma and why, you know, why she's sick. Uh, you know, we know that it's probably related to COVID, but it's never really uh, said out loud. So if I could add it, I, I would add more about Diamond, about Diamond. Yeah. What do you think, Caitlin? Yeah, I would also say add, uh, <laughs> add some more. Um, I think definitely a little bit more about Diamond's backstory, um, like Jarrell said, but uh, the first thing I think of is also having a few more interactions happen in what we called the surreal world while we were uh, creating the storyboard. Um, yeah, over the summer, our original narrative had a few more interactions than just the one demon. Um, so if if we were able to ha have a closer to 40 minute movie instead of 60, like less than 20 minute movie, uh, we were gonna have more interactions that Diamond had with other creatures um, in the world with Luella. Amazing, next question. Hi, um, I'm Samara again. And my question is for both of you. Um, how did you guys make this scene look super real? Like everything like so slow motion and how did you make it look really real? I would say it's a combination. Thank you for your question, first of all. I, I love that question as well. I have a feeling when I love all the questions. It's a really, really smart question. So uh, I think it's a combination between Caitlin's detailed work and Jeff and I filming. You know, um, it was important that it looked real enough, right? Like it needs to resemble the real world, but we also wanted to create a world where creatures might crawl out of places, you know, it's supernatural. So we wanted to make it real enough that you would believe it's the real world, but not so real that you wouldn't believe that creatures could come crawling out of the side. Yeah, and I would say a big part of it is also the puppetry mechanics in terms of making like, they're, they're basically like paper cutouts. So it's like, um, how you move them and like giving them subtle movements like you would in real life kind of helps imitate life in a more like believable way, um, kind of like all puppetry. So really like honing in on that. And like when we were working with the train, our first scene with the train, I was there for that day. So just like realizing we needed like some little bumps in like the train as well as like the background moving behind. And once we realized we needed the train to have that little like constant bump and constant movement um, really helped sell the train as well, instead of it being like still on the table while like the background moved behind it. Um, so finding like little details like that, not just in the train's movement, but also like the people's movement and the creature's movements um, was, yeah, just helping all those little details come to life. Uh, okay, uh, this question is for Jarrell. Why did you choose the Spanish flu out of all these other viruses and diseases? You chose the Spanish flu, why? Thank you for that question. That's a fantastic question. I chose the Spanish flu because in my mind, that was the last time 
America had dealt with kind of a sickness that was as big as the sickness that we're dealing with now. So, and there were things that were happening a hundred years ago that are still happening today. And so using that was a really great way to say, you know, look at what, <laughs> uh, it was a really great way to say, you know, some of the things that we're dealing with now we've dealt with before. So do we want to do something about it now? Now that we know that a hundred years have passed and we're still dealing with some of these same things, do you think it's time for us to maybe figure out a different way of doing things? That's why. Okay. okay. Next question. Okay. Hi, I'm Sasha. And my question is for Jarrell. So when did you think about making this production? Like when you were eating, while you were sleeping, you were just dreaming about it? Like watching the news. All right, Sasha, thank you for that question. So once uh, Jackie, who's the um, artistic director of Chicago Children's Theater, asked if, if I maybe had any ideas of stories, you have to remember, Sasha, when we came up with this, everything was still stuck. We were still in quarantine and no one was going out and we didn't know what we were going to do. And so once Jackie began to ask me, I started thinking. Um, and so I think it. It didn't come to me in a dream. I think I read, Caitlin and I um, read some books, some very old books, um, you know, children's literature and children's novels, you know, that's been around for a while. So we read some really, really old books. And then we thought we liked some of the ideas in the book, but we knew that the books were too old, right? We didn't want to do something that was that old. So Caitlin and I basically put our heads together and we tried to figure out how to use the ideas from that book in a contemporary or modern day setting. So we're in Chicago right now. So we wanted to make it about Chicago. So that's where the idea came from. Maybe a little bit of sleeping and dreaming. I think that everything gets done with a little bit of sleeping and dreaming. Thank you for that question. I'm next. And uh, one of my questions is if like, what type of technology did you use? Did you use, like, green screen in, as, like, an example? Like, I'm just wondering. Caitlin, you want to take that one? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll actually go get a smaller cranky that I have here so I can kind of show what a cranky is because that's probably the most, like, technology we used but um i don't know if Jarrell wants to talk anything about yeah the other I can, I can camera aspect yeah. <laughs> so there were a couple of things was it casper right who asked the question all right so we did not use green screen everything that you saw in the film was done by hand so the small puppets were made by hand they were operated by hand this is me holding a remote like it's a puppet you know doo -doo 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 oh no i'm going up Oh no, I'm upside down. Ah! So <laughs> everything that we did was done by hand. And so probably outside of camera, like we did film it with technological cameras. Yeah, we had film cameras, but not like huge film cameras that you see in like, like major motion pictures. We had smaller cameras and that's how we filmed. Um, but honestly, like the most technological was the cranky, which Caitlin's gonna kind of demonstrate right now. Yeah, so I have a tiny cranky story that I made around the holidays of a polar bear decorating a Yule tree, which is the like origins of the Christmas tree. Um, if I go on mute, is my camera still in other people's view? The paper can be a little loud. So I just wanna- Yep, you're good. Cool. As long as you keep your camera on. <laughs> okay, great. So I'm going to go on mute so you don't have to listen to the paper. Um, and it gets, so yeah. And now, I'll, so as you see, Caitlin's going to begin turning. And as you turn, the image moves. So it's almost like a really old fashioned picture book. I don't know if you've ever made a flip book. Um, where you draw images and then you flip them. So this is just another version of that. It's not the same thing, but I, in my mind, it's similar. And that's how we had the moving images. And so what we would do, Casper, is we would have that cranky going in the background. And while the cranky was going, we would have small puppets in front of the cranky going, oh, no, I'm walking. Oh, no, I'm getting up. Oh, I'm upside down again. What is it happening? Oh. Mm -hmm. 
that makes sense because the part where it's almost at the end where they got into the dark place where it's pretty dark that was what you were using when when like it i think it was showing like a bit of diamond's life that's what it was doing okay. yeah it's, it's our flashback our flashback scenes mm -hmm. or the cranky scenes or the or the train moving yeah what a fantastic question okay this question is for Caitlin. Was it easy making everything out of cardboard and trying to make things functional? Uh, so kind of <laughs> what I do all the time is try to solve that problem. Uh, so easy, no, but I've had a lot of practice doing it and learned a lot of tricks along the way. Um, so it's kind of like anything, the more you do it, the better you're gonna get at it. So it's like, yeah, I started drawing like when I was like in elementary school, but like now that I'm like 30 plus, <laughs> uh, I can draw a lot better because I've practiced a lot. Um, so as you practice with anything, it gets a little bit faster, you know, some more tricks after hitting some like mistakes <laughs> and failures along the way, you learn a lot from that. Um, so then you start to know kind of like other ways of doing things that might give you a little bit of a shortcut um, in terms of doing it. So it was, it took a lot of time, <laughs> but uh, since I've made a lot of like quick drawings before I figured out a way to kind of like do an assembly line to get it all done um but yeah there were some late nights <laughs> making puppets to make sure that they had what they needed the next day and late night handoffs to Jarrell's uh apartment uh but yeah um I think that might answer your question thank you I also really like that answer Thank you so much. Who's uh, who's next? Me. And the question I'm asking is pretty small, so I'll add a little comment add to it. Um, who was your? I mean, who was Diamond texting? Diamond was texting his aunt D. So okay, if and you then look really close, you can see it, but it is hard to see it. So that's an excellent question. Okay, and the little comment is, I see one of the monsters that was planned out in Caitlin's background. Um, I have a question for Jarrell and then Miss Kate. Um, Jarrell, I wanted to know how long did the production and you know the writing take? We started in July or August. We started in the middle of summer and we finished literally the day before it went online. So about, <laughs> about July or August until January 16th, because it had to go up on the 17th of January. So however long that is, that's how long it took. <laughs> yeah, I would, I, I know we started in June because it was before one of my friend's birthdays. June, but, oh my goodness, it was even yeah. longer. We had even more time, that's so, so funny. Yeah, yeah, from like June, July, August, we kind of were working a few hours each week, meeting and thinking about ideas. Um, so it definitely wasn't like full time, 40 hours a week in the summer, coming up with the idea of the story, but we would have like weekly meetings to kind of like check in on how, what we're thinking about, what's inspiring us. Um, and then coming up with kind of like a, I'm gonna say four page, including some sketches narrative of what the story was. And then we kind of took a little bit of a pause until I'm gonna say like October, November, when we switched from just having the ideas to having a plan that we were going to build everything in toy theater and have it launch on Martin Luther King Day. Um, so then we started planning deadlines of, of the story being finished with all of the dialogue, casting the characters, getting the team together, building all the puppets. So it kind of went into like full-time mode, at least for me to build everything. 
I started, it was still probably part-time because I got other jobs going on, but um, probably part-time doing like 10 to 20 hours a week starting in November. And then once we hit December was when we went into really full-time planning um, where Jarrell and Jeff and the whole crew were meeting probably closer to 30 to 40 hours a week, depending on yeah. the holiday schedule. Um, until like the week before Martin Luther King, where Jeff was editing all of the film footage together um, and syncing it with Dan's audio. Um, yeah, I think once we, once we got to December, like it was kind of open until we got to like the holiday season. Mm -hmm. And then once we got to the end of December, we were at Chicago Children's Theater, I think I want to say five out of seven days, mm -hmm. about eight hours a day filming every day yeah so it was a slow yeah. so it was let's it was say a slow like rollout. six months <laughs> six months ish for the whole process but like the the last month was the most intense yeah i was just asking considering the fact that you probably had to get it done at a certain day or time um maybe even second um caitlin my question for you is what do you make the characters out of? So the characters are all on a type of like thicker paper, similar-ish to like poster board that you guys might use for posters. Um, it's called railroad board. So it's like a, a, it's not as like, it's not, it's thicker than computer paper. Um, maybe like cardstock is another type of word but specifically we chose railroad board because i had used it in some other like puppet workshops i had been a part of um it's durable for like all the joints even though we didn't have a lot of animated puppets um the puppet workshop that i used it on was like puppets that have like a lot of arms or head like things that need to move independently um to help animate them so railroad board was the main thing and then in terms of what I colored all of the characters with, um, it's a lot of colored pencils. And then these guys were colored pencils and then a lot of like fine Sharpies to get like all the black like detail lines to help all of their features pop. And then um, some of the other characters, especially like the monster, um, he was a lot of markers. Um, and last but not least, Miss Caitlin, um, I have another question. Yes. I wanted to know how long did the little puppets take? Yes. Um, hmm. Each puppet, it's a little different. Once we had designed what Luella and Diamond were going to wear, um, then it became a little bit faster. The first few took longer once I figured out what they were going to be wearing and how they were going to look and what color they were going to be. And Jarell approved it. Um, I would say for, for one of these guys um i would maybe make like five at a time so i would say maybe in like two hours i could make five of these um maybe in an hour once i got jive in and i was watching a lot of we were talking about watching a lot of holiday movies on netflix while we were making all of our things um so i was kind of multitasking while i did that so that's sort of an answer um but yeah, each one took a little bit of different amount of time, depending on what they had to do, so. I I have a question for Jarrell. Who, who did the, who did the um, music of the movie I meant to show? So the music was written uh, by a, a sound designer and music composer named Dan Ison. Uh, D A N first name I S O N last name um, Dan Ison and he uh, lives in he's in uh, Delaware Delaware the first state on the East Coast um, and so he created the original music we worked together before I like him a lot I like his music a lot I think he's a fantastic person to create things with so and he was excited about the idea he was really excited about this idea and he really put a lot into it so yeah i'm glad you asked that question we got a chance to talk about dan so i have a question for both of you you can both um you can both take turns 
answering it if you want. I'm sure you guys are both going to have like a similar, a similar answer. So, was the bird that Luella turned into her spirit animal? So, not quite spirit animal, but um, we wanted. It was kind of like um, I'm trying to think of like the best way to explain it because I guess spirit animal is more for the indigenous um, yeah. population of the nation, but um, it's more like what her how her feelings were and kind of like inside her and as we were developing Luella as a character we wanted her to be a shapeshifter um turning into the bird for this production was like the one time she really did that but if we were to expand the story she would kind of turn into other creatures depending on the needs of the moment um and the need of the moment at that time was um something that was powerful enough to save Diamond, but at the same time kind of had an essence of Luella's kind of like soft nature. So she she turned into kind of like a powerful bird, um, but still maintained qualities of like her purple dress and her flowers. Um, so yeah, I think that answers. Yeah, it had, and yeah, it had more to do with wanting to make sure that Luella that we showed that Luella had uh, something that was beautiful, but also fierce inside of her um, because she she has great love, especially after, you know, it's so funny, especially after I wrote, you know, what her story was and how her how her human story came to an end. We learned about that in the, in the story of the film, right? So because of that, I really wanted to make sure that she had, she was more than just this kind of forgotten character, that she does have power inside of her as well, that she has beauty inside of her as well. And, and that beauty, you know, that beauty and that power isn't passive. A lot of times you have female characters and the beauty is passive. Oh, they're beautiful and someone has to save them. But Luella's beauty and her ferocity is actually something that gives her the ability to save Diamond, if that makes sense, yeah? So that she's not just the kind of passive, a passive figure, you know. Um, and what's the most, you know, it was the most beautiful, you know, the bird that Caitlin created. I just said a bird. Caitlin came up with the idea of having having her look. I mean, we looked at images, <laughs> but honestly, Caitlin designed that. And when I saw it, that even though I didn't know exactly what she would look like as a bird, when Caitlin showed me what she came up with, it was per I thought it was perfect. Um, you know, the use of color, her, that spread of the eagle, you know, that whole idea and, you know, the fact that she's protecting her friend. She's protecting someone who valued her story, who listened to her and went on this journey. And now she gets a chance to, to kind of look out for him. I just thought that was a beautiful thing. That's where the idea of the bird came from. But Caitlin's right. If this were a longer piece, she would turn into other things and it would be a, maybe a little bit more clear that she doesn't always stay in one form. Okay, I have two questions. One, one of my classmates already asked, asked one. Okay, I one of my um, questions were, how old were, are they? And this question is for. Um, I think we said diamond. Oh wait, it's for, diamond is eleven, and Luella is twelve. Oh. I think that's what we said. So they're both in the preteen range, you know. Okay. And, and Okay, and my second my second question was who are their parents? That is a very good question. What do you think? I actually don't know. I think it's you guys. <laughs> <laughs> In a way. Yeah, we don't learn that much about Diamond's parents. We learn a little bit about Luella's parents mm -hmm. at the beginning based on what she can remember, right? Because she's been asleep for so long. Yeah. But Diamond's parents, we really don't learn a lot. I know that whoever they are, they care about him very much. That's why he. That's why he's dressed and he looks like somebody cares about him. And it's also, it's also why his aunt spends so much time texting him because they care very much about him. But we don't learn about him, you're right. 
Yeah, and uh, Lu yeah, there's no specifics, but uh, one of the reasons why Luella has flowers in her hair is um, because when children died, sometimes flowers would go in their hair um, before they were sort of like buried or remembered, kind of like as part of the remembrance of them, they would put flowers in their hair. So that's where that comes from, of her parents. Um, yeah. And my last question is, was, were the other people um, spirits? The demon and the fuzzies are for sure like spirits in the spirit world. Yeah. Was that everybody? Yeah. Oh, yes. man. Fantastic. Well, y'all, that was an amazing question to answer session. Thank you so much to Jarrell and to Caitlin, our student hosts from Urban Explorers of Chicago. And thank you audience out there for listening in. For more information about Diamond's Dream and to view our free study guide, you can visit chicagochildrenstheater.org. You can also find the link on our website and the study guide in the chat. I'm about to put them in there. A recording of this webinar will be available soon on our YouTube channel, CCTV. And be sure to check out Urban Explorers of Chicago. Follow them on Instagram at Urban Explorers of Chicago. Great job, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day. Bye. Have a blessed day. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Have a good Bye. evening. Bye. Have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>